Uh, and then last but not least, Stefan, uh, should we still talk about traditional practice effectiveness? Okay. So what should we talk about? We could talk about the whole time. So was your question like how to square intensive traditional practice with trauma sensitive practice? Does that sum it up or? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll add a couple more notes. Maybe I don't know if that'll be helpful, but sure. um, just picturing some like grumpy Ajahn from the Thai forest tradition, like, looking at how we do things and like, ah, oh, we just like, we worry so much about overwhelm. I love overwhelm. It's great. Cause you know, like we know the yellow part's good, but I feel like there's probably like, like yogis and, and like, you know, uh, monks that are, that probably think overwhelms just fine. Um, and, and can probably take you through to the other side. So, um, I don't, I mean, I certainly don't want to have to launder overwhelm uh, with my students. I'd love to avoid it. But yeah, I am just trying to square the hardcore traditional and, and today's tendency towards safety. Yes. Uh, there's so much here. Um, uh, uh, I'll caveat this by saying I'm in just big debates with people, as imagine some of you are, around safe spaces. And safe spaces, particularly within uh, for youth and in grade school, like, well, what does that mean? And is that helping? And um, and when when is the expectation of fragility actually leaving people disempowered? So I just I'm I, I I'm with you, uh, and I can think of the Ajans like you're saying, who are just like, God damn it, why do we have to be so careful? And I mean, people can hear my practice and they're like, oh, yawn. Like we're walking on eggshells, just trying to keep everyone happy. And, you know, so um, I'm actually with you and I save it as someone who's done a lot of intensive practice. Like I love the sitting on the edge of the well, so I don't fall asleep kind of practice. Here's my take is you can have big experiences. And when it comes to trauma, they often won't be integratable unless there was some kind of respect around the overwhelm. So I think intensive practice can blow people out. So I'll give an example. Did we talk about holotropic breathwork the first session? We might have. Um, okay. So do any of you, uh, holotropic breathwork is a, uh, a practice by Stanislav Graf where you do intensive breathing practice for what, like 20 minutes. Some of you will know it with music and a partner and spirit rock. Jack Cornfield actually did holotropic breathwork retreats. So that was a very intensive practice. And Stefan, we could talk about whether it's like related to traditional, more traditional practices, but it was like blasting people open in a big way. And one of the things that I found in my years of study was that just because someone had a big opening in an intensive practice didn't mean that they could integrate it. Their window stayed the same size. And in trauma theory, the way that you widen the window over time is that you become dysregulated and then you actually are able to come back into your window, that you stayed online on some level. And that to me is, that's what trauma theory can offer us here is that more is not always better when it comes to intensity. Sure, you could live through the, the intensive practice and maybe you have some in, uh, insights around it, but how is that impacting the nervous system? I'm skeptical of big experiences where you're not able to stay mindful and online and then actually re-regulate, come back into your window and metabolize the experience. So I'm all for intensive practice. I just don't know, always know how practical it is um, along the way. And I have deep respect for the Ajans who, you know, it's not like we're trying to reinvent the wheel here. Um, I just have questions about intensive practice. So what would you say? What would you add? What would you push, push back on? Yeah, nothing to push back on. I just, I just like, I just like nudging the edges of of concepts, you know. And but I was already like really, I'm already really like loving all these resources and, and tools. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's helpful. And and I and I, I like also using this as an opportunity to question the efficacy of like traditional like hardcore like practices because maybe you know they're maybe maybe they're they're considered more effective without questioning them than they actually are. So that's another thing I wanted to, to question now that we have more like um, resources to understand the human being. Yeah. yeah, because that's like, I'm I'm trying to bring a contemporary trauma lens to how we are all practicing meditation or contemplative practice. That's all. I'm just kind of using it as glasses. Like what would tra contemporary trauma 
folks say about looking through the glasses of that, how would they say about the way that people practice meditation? And Buddhist teachers will remind me, I mean, Sean, I'm curious your take on this, but I mean, those that are steeped in traditional practice will say there are multiple lists inside of traditional Buddhist practice that give guidance on how to work with trauma. It's not like I'm doing, this is maybe somewhat new, but there's lots of guidance about you back off, you open your eyes. You're, this isn't new, but it's a particular lens, integrating neuroscience and all those learnings. I hope it's useful, but I don't want to try to pretend that like people have been re-traumatizing themselves in Buddhist practice for 2,600 years at all. I don't think so. Um, I wouldn't say that. So Sean, anything you want to add or what others want to say there? Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like we could, this is a really rich topic and there's a lot to talk about. Um, but in, term, in terms of like some of the hardcore practices, um, you know, some of them are like, you know, uh, meditating in front of a bunch of corpses or um, going on a long walk through tiger territory uh, with only sandals, no food and an alms bowl where like tigers could come out and get you um, or, um, you know, meditating all night and then through the next day without notice. <laughs> Um, on a hardwood or like on a hardwood floor or a concrete slab or something with no cushion or anything. Um, but, you know, I think that like the Buddha himself talked a lot about how uh, metta practice or loving kindness practice can help you and support you through some of those scary times, uh, metta for self, metta for others. Um, you know, a lot of the practices were either geared for uh, enhancing wisdom and or compassion. And, you know, there's lots of reminders that uh, if one wing is really strong and the other wing is not very strong to balance out, um, that uh, if the wing of wisdom is really, really heavy, then maybe we can do some compassion practice or heart heart-based heart practice. And then if the heart-based practices are really strong, but the wing of wisdom is really weak, then um, do practices that balance um, that wing of wisdom. So there's lots of talk about balance, you know, self-assessment. If you're getting too far um, lopsided on one of those two wings of awakening to, to just remember to balance out the wings, but usually heart-based practices were the ways to um, support us during those more difficult times through the loving kindness, compassion, uh, joy, equanimity, gratitude, forgiveness, um, generosity, um, and then that sense of community. You know, a lot of these hardcore masters like Ajahn Chah um, really emphasize community, you know, sticking together, um, asking questions, staying close to the teacher. Um, you know, uh, fostering that sense of connection with people you trust, uh, people who've walked the path before you and make sure you maintain those open lines of communication. Um, so anyway, those are just a few random uh, thoughts on that. But it's a really rich topic and I appreciate you bringing that up, Stefan. <laughs>